All right, I think I got everything now. Okay, great. So we're going to go through conceptually. A review of kinematics. So you're going to take notes on that PDF. So you're going to add to the slides as we review and go over the concepts and the diagrams. The practice problems are located in the um, PDFs labeled um, linear kinematics exam and then exam one and two D kinematics. Okay, so I'm just waiting on Anna to get back and we'll get started. Okay, so again, this review is going to be basically the first two units we covered, which is one and two dimensional kinematics. Anna, did you get the document or didn't print? It prints like one page every 30 seconds. Okay, um, just use, come here, use mine. There you go. <laughs> Actually, I think it only printed the first four pages. One, two, three, four. It did only print the first four pages. What is going on? I don't even know. It's like mine is only printing the last four pages. Oh, really? Well, I have the first four and you have the last four. There you go. Okay. So oh, we're good. Eight pages? Um, there, oh no, there is like 18. 18. Why isn't it printing? So you have the last four pages? I have all but probably like the middle section, which I can, I have the backs of many pages that I can just like copy it down. You shouldn't have to though. All right, so you need pages. Why does it do that? It, you're telling it exactly what to print. So you need five, two, fourteen. Print. All right, I'm sorry, it's, why, why, why? <laughs> All right, four, two, 14. All right, so we're gonna get started and if, if it prints, um, I will let you know. Okay, so you guys should be able to see my screen. On the right-hand side of the screen are the major vocab words that we're gonna go over. And again, this is the first two units, one and two dimensional kinematics. So starting with the difference between these uh, types of quantities, whether they're vector or scalar quantities, knowing what a vector and a scalar, scalar quantity is, how to read position versus time, velocity versus time, and acceleration versus time graphs, how to use those graphs to model motion. And then for two-dimensional motion, we talk about projectile motion, free fall, and the big four equations. So we're gonna try and cover all of that information in this review session. So starting with distance. Okay, so we know that distance is um, the 
path or the length of that path traveled. It includes every step that you take. Okay, so distance is the length of the path traveled. Includes every step that you take. The units we use for distance is meters. And distance is a, you guys tell me, is distance a scalar or a vector quantity? Go ahead, Anna. A scalar quantity. Scalar. Okay, so distance is a scalar quantity. Direction does not matter. So there should be, you're going to add a checkbox next to scalar quantity. Okay, so specifically, if we have an object that begins over here on the re left hand side, and it moves along this path here and ends at a position along the right hand side. Our distance includes every segment of that path. So we add up every step. So we're gonna add up each line segment and its length. So we'll add D1 to D2 to D3. So we numerically add without considering direction each line segment each path traveled, and that would give us our total distance. Okay, so direction does not matter. If it, you ask for distance, you add each and consider each line segment in describing that motion. Okay, and again, that's because distance is a scalar quantity. Okay, the vector version of distance is displacement. If I'm going too fast, just let me know. Okay, our example here for distance traveled, what is the distance traveled for the object between zero and six seconds? So on the screen here and on your notes, we have a position versus time graph. It shows that the position is beginning at the origin at zero meters. At two seconds, the object has traveled four meters. Okay, so initially we go from zero to four meters. After two seconds, the object then moves from two, sorry, from four to zero meters again. So the change in that position is another four meters. So the object goes from zero meters to four meters and then from four meters to zero meters until we reach four seconds. From four to six seconds, the object goes from a location of zero meters to negative four meters. So that change in position again would be four meters. If we wanna find the distance, we're gonna add up each segment of motion. So we're going to add four meters to four meters to four meters. Okay, we do not use negative signs here. We do not include the direction. We're talking about distance. So the total path traveled, the total length traveled would be 12 total meters. Because we're not including direction, distance is always going to be a positive value. It's a scalar quantity, so direction would not matter. So distance traveled to the object is 12 total meters. OK. So displacement. Displacement is also measured in meters, just like distance. Displacement, however, is the difference between the final and the initial positions. It is a vector quantity. 
So direction matters. It is a vector quantity. Direction matters. So it's the straight line dif distance between the final and the initial position. So we take a look at back at that same example. If we have, let's say, a bug, right, that starts out on the left-hand side of the screen, it's going to crawl its way to the right, back up to the left, and then one more time to the right. For the distance, we added up each line segment. For displacement, we're going to evaluate the straight line difference between the initial position and the final position. Okay, so we want the vector equivalent, the length of that vector, that straight line, from x initial to x final. We would find that displacement, which we use delta x to represent, by subtracting the final and the initial position. So we would take the initial position and we'd subtract it from the final position. So displacement is a change in the position. Distance is every step taken or the ad addition, the sum of the line segments. Okay, so let's apply this same principle to the um, same example as before. Okay, as we said, displacement is a vector. So that same example as before. Ooh. That should work the right way. Why did that happen? Okay. Now we're frozen. Yikes. Okay, so same example from before. What is the displacement of this same object from zero to six seconds? So displacement, we want to identify where does the object, what position does the object begin? And where, what position does the object end? So you want to identify on this graph the initial and the final positions. So the object's going to begin when time is zero. It's going to begin at the origin, according to the graph that's zero meters. So the initial position is zero. The final position at six seconds is negative four meters. Okay, so using our equation, delta x equals um, final minus initial position. We're going to plug in negative 4 for v final, for x final, excuse me, and 0 for x initial. We get negative 4. So the displacement is negative 4. The distance traveled is 12 meters. Displacement can be negative or positive, and those represent the direction. Okay, again, stop me if I'm going too fast. Um, speed. Speed is also a scalar quantity. When we use the terminology average speed, we mean the rate of distance per time over usually a large time interval. So we're to figure out what the average speed is over a large time interval. When you see the words instantaneous speed, it is the rate of distance per time per unit time at a particular instant. Okay, so particular instant meaning a very small time interval. So average speed is over a larger time interval, instantaneous speed is over a small time interval or at an exact instant. Speed has a units of meters per second, which we can derive from the equation. 
Speed is also a scalar quantity because it relies on distance. Okay, so distance is a scalar. Speed relies on distance. So speed is also a scalar quantity. The equation for speed, which we'll get to in a second, is derived from the previous definition of distance. Okay, so basically, we're going to include the entire distance, the entire path traveled, and we're going to divide that by the time. Okay, so this is in terms of average speed. If we're asked for the average speed, we take the entire distance traveled, and we divide by the time interval, how long it took to travel that entire path. If we're talking about instantaneous speed, we would be identifying only a smaller section of this object's motion, and we're dividing the distance from that smaller section divided by time. Okay, don't worry about the limit idea here. But if we wanted the speed at the very end of the motion, we would take the displacement from the last second and divide by one second to find that speed. Okay, so instantaneous means over an instant, over a second, or two seconds max. Average speed is over the entire time interval. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. So what is the average speed of the object between zero and six seconds. So it gives us in the problem, right? Oh, this is why I thought I had this perfected. I'm sorry, guys, give me a second. Oh, they're fading in. No, it should be fading in. Why is this not working? Play. And now my computer is going to freeze. Excellent. <sighs> All right, that's okay. We're just going to have to deal. Okay, so according to our graph, okay, we determined earlier that the distance traveled is 12. From zero to two seconds, the object travels four meters. From two to four seconds, the object travels four more meters. And then from four to six seconds, the object travels four additional meters. So the distance, the total distance traveled would be 12 meters. The change in time is six seconds. So if you want the average speed, we're going to take 12 meters and divide by 6 seconds. We get an average speed of 2 meters per second. We would not include a positive or a negative sign because speed is a scalar quantity and does not rely on direction. So it can only be a positive value. Are there any questions there? OK, so let's head to velocity. So velocity, average velocity, is the rate at which position changes with time. So basically, we take displacement, which is the vector quantity, and we divide by the time. If you want instantaneous velocity, that just means the velocity at a particular instant. So when I take the displacement over a second and divide by that time interval, that change in time. Okay, most commonly we'll be asked for average velocity, but instantaneous velocity is the velocity at a specific time interval versus average velocity is the average velocity over a general larger time interval. Because velocity relies on displacement or position, it is a scalar quantity. Because displacement is a scalar quantity, the units we use are meters per second, just like for speed. If we have that same situation in which a bug begins at initial position, moves across the screen to the left, to the right, to the left again, 
To find the average velocity, we would simply take the displacement delta x, the straight line distance from the initial to the final position, and we would divide by how long it took the bug to get there. Okay, instantaneous velocity, we would just take delta x over that very specific time interval, which is usually about a second. Okay, so let's again apply this to the previous example that we looked at before. So average velocity of the object between zero and six seconds. The initial position of the object. So when time is zero, the initial position is zero meters. And we, we discussed this before in the previous examples. At six seconds, the object is located at negative four meters. So delta x is negative four meters. We take negative four and we subtract zero, we'll get negative four. So our velocity is going to be negative four meters divided by the change in time, which was given to us. It's six seconds. We take negative four and divide by six seconds. We get negative two thirds meters per second. Negative two thirds meters per second. Okay. Next up, we have acceleration. Acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes over time, okay, with respect to time. It points in the direction of the net force. So we can figure out what the acceleration. Andrew, question? Oh, I'm sorry, I just joined. Oh, okay. I was wondering why I was echoing, but it's Christian. Hi, Christian. Hello, how are you? Good. Okay, so there are guided notes in classroom, Christian. If you haven't seen, we're adding to those notes. Okay, got it. So if you haven't printed those, I suggest that you do that. Yep. Okay. Right. So acceleration is a rate at which velocity changes in respect to time. We can find the direction of the acceleration by drawing a free body diagram. So whichever direction the net force points in, that gives us the direction of acceleration. When we learned about acceleration, we didn't yet know about net forces. So there is another way to find the acceleration um, direction. And that is by investigating the change in velocity. Okay, so the direction in which the velocity changes tells us our acceleration rates. Okay, so we can examine whether the object is speeding up or slowing down and in what direction. That gives us information about the object's acceleration if we're not able to draw a free body diagram. Okay, so I hope my slide, my uh, animation's gonna work for me on this one. The units for acceleration we know is meters per second squared. That comes from the equation. Acceleration relies on velocity. Velocity is a vector quantity. So that means that acceleration is also a vector quantity. It has both magnitude and direction. Okay, so... Anna, just to let you know, the page is printed if, you're, if we're past your um, slide. So we're gonna take a look at a example. So again, we'll relate this to the bug example. So we have a bug, maybe a ladybug, starting on the left-hand side of the screen at some initial time with some initial velocity. As the bug moves across the screen to the right in a perfectly straight line, is there a question? 
Christian's just grabbing his notes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just didn't want to interrupt. Sorry about that. No problem. I just heard a a ding, so I wanted to ask if it was a hand raise or. Okay, so as a bug begins to move across the page, we see that each time interval, the position, that blue dot, gets further and further away. Okay, so those blue dots, right, these are called motion diagrams. That blue dot represents the object's position at a constant time interval. So the change in time between each of these dots would be the same amount of time, let's say two seconds. So every two second time interval, our position is going to increase over that rate. So you can see here that the initial versus the final position has drastically increased over that constant time interval. We use, anyone remember, it's kind of already labeled for us, but anyone remember the lengths of the arrows in between the dots on our motion diagram? What do those arrows or those vectors tell us? So if our position markers are increasing, the space between the position market markers are increasing over time, what does that tell us? Anna? That the object is slowing down. Um, uh, isn't like the size of it like matter because uh, if it's like increasing, it, the velocity is also increasing. So like it's like speeding up over time because it's going over a longer distance. Right. So, all right, I'm going to try and etch over this, but it might cause my computer to freeze and shut down. So give me a second. All right, no, that didn't work. Um, I would like to draw this on here. And screencastify. Oh, it's working. Yes. Is it working? No. Oh, it says it's recording, but I can't write. Can I write? No. All right, I'm gonna have to do this instead. <sighs> Should have brought my computer from home because it works much better than this. Okay. Sorry guys, I'm just waiting for a Jamboard to load. It's gonna take a minute. There we go. So if the object's position decreases over time, So these little black markers, right, on a motion diagram, those markers represent the object's position at constant time intervals. So just like in our tractor lab, right, each sugar packet represented the position of the tractor at two second intervals. The spacing between those positions gives us an idea about the magnitude of the object's velocity, right? So we're looking at consistent changes in time 
and we're comparing the change in position over consistent changes in time. So the vectors or the length of the vector that connects the position markers gives us an idea about the change in the object's position over time, meaning the velocity over time. So as you can see here, the spacing, the spacing, if it decreases, that means that the magnitude of the velocity decreases. So if velocity is decreasing over time, that means the object is slowing down. Right, it's slowing down in this case to the right in the positive direction. So object is slowing down. in the positive direction. Because the length of the velocity vectors are getting smaller, they're decreasing over time. So if it's slowing down in the positive direction, that means our change in velocity, if it's slowing down, our change in velocity is negative our change in position is positive. Okay, which means that we are basically decelerating, right? Our object is slowing down. We have negative acceleration. In the example on the slides, our position markers, the spacing is increasing over time. So if the position, the change in position over constant time intervals is increasing, that means our velocity is increasing in the positive direction. If our velocity increases in the positive direction over time, the object has a positive acceleration. It is speeding up in the positive direction. So we take that positive change in velocity and we divide by time. Okay, and that's the equation for acceleration. Acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. So we take the final velocity of the object, we subtract the initial velocity from that final velocity, and we divide by the change in time. We take the final minus the initial time. Okay, so just to summarize here, our acceleration would be positive because our change in velocity is positive and the object is moving in the positive direction. So we would say that the object is accelerating in the positive direction. So if acceleration and velocity are both positive, the change in the velocity is positive, meaning velocity is increasing and the acceleration is positive, we say that they point in the same direction, so we have positive acceleration. If acceleration and velocity point in opposite directions, acceleration is negative. Okay, acceleration is negative. If, they, if velocity and acceleration point in opposite directions, which is sometimes called decelerating. Okay, so if acceleration and velocity point in the same direction, we have positive acceleration. If they point in opposite directions, we have negative acceleration. You can also find that direction by drawing a free body diagram. Are there any questions with motion diagrams? 
Um, I'm all good. Thank you, Christian. Okay. Oh, I swear that I fixed this. <laughs> oh, all right, I'm just gonna keep going. It's fine. There's nothing I can do about it and I don't wanna waste any more time. Oh, and now we're recording on screen Castify. Okay. So on your guided notes, there's a multiple choice question to help us kind of talk about this. So in which two cases does the acceleration of the wall point to the right? So as you go through, we're going to use arrows to represent the acceleration and the velocity vectors. Okay, so based on the diagram, we're gonna use um, blue and yellow to help us out. Okay, so um, yellow is going to represent acceleration, and the blue is actually going to uh, um, represent the position of the object. Okay, because based on our diagram from the previous slide, blue was represented by the position markers, and red was represented by velocity, and yellow is represented by acceleration. So we use a yellow arrow to represent the direction of the acceleration, and a blue vector to represent the um, change in position. Okay, so ball moving right and slowing down. If it's moving to the right, our position vector is going to be pointing to the right in the positive direction. If the object is slowing down, however, which direction is the acceleration vector pointing? Uh, would it be to the left? The left, the opposite direction. Good. Okay, for B, the object's moving to the right and it's speeding up. So again, our blue vector, our position vector is gonna be positive. If it's speeding up, acceleration, or sorry, technically it's um, velocity here. I should have made that uh, red. Velocity is going to be uh, to the right. It's increasing. For part C, ball is moving to the left. So our position vector is going to be pointing to the left in the negative direction. If it's slowing down, the change in the velocity is going to be to, to the, hmm. yes, to the right. Okay, so the object is moving left but slowing down. Um, just kidding. It's, uh, that means that th this uh, yellow vector is acceleration. Okay. So speeding up in the rightward direction, yes, acceleration is positive. If it's moving to the left and slowing down, the acceleration um, is going to basically be accelerating to the left. Or just kidding. Um, I'm sorry, guys, my brain's fried. I got to uh, look at this again. Ball moving left and slowing down. All right, so what that's going to look like, I'll use blue for my position. Ball is moving to the left, but it's slowing down. So if it's slowing down my position markers, the spacing between them is going to decrease over time. So as we move left, the spacing between those markers is going to decrease. I'm gonna use red again to represent the velocity. So my velocity vectors are going to decrease in the leftward direction. So my position here, right, we're moving in the negative direction. And we are, our velocity is decreasing, so we are slowing down. Okay, so we are slowing down in the negative direction. OK. 
Okay, so both my displacement, the change in position, and my change in velocity are going to be, right, acceleration is change in velocity. My change in velocity is going to be towards the positive direction. So this is my acceleration vector. So both my direction, my velocity, they're going to be in the same direction. So the object is technically accelerating. Okay, versus previous example we looked up looked at up here, which Anna had mentioned, if we're slowing down in the positive direction, velocity is decreasing, but position is positive. My acceleration is in the opposite direction. So we are decelerating because change in velocity is negative, position is positive. So we're gonna have a negative acceleration. For answer choice C, which we have a motion diagram for here, technically our change in velocity is going to be negative, right? Our velocity is decreasing. Our change in position is going to be negative, right? It's moving to the left, and each instant, it moves further and further to the left. So change in position and change in velocity have the same sign. So that means the object will have a positive acceleration. Positive acceleration. There we go. Okay, and last one. Object is moving left. So my blue, my position vector is still going to be pointing to the left, but it is speeding up. So my yellow vector is going to be pointing to the... Um, speeding up to the right. Yes. So our answers here, we want to identify the vectors with the positive direction. So our yellow vector is pointing to the right. Yellow stands for acceleration. So that leaves us with only answer choices B and C. Are there any questions here? So I know you guys have that chart on your note card. You obviously don't get your note card on the AP exam. So you're going to have to remember, right, you need to consult the velocity vector to determine which direction the object's moving. And then you're going to have to look at the change in velocity compared to the acceleration of the um, object to figure out if it's accelerating, meaning positive acceleration, or decelerating, meaning negative acceleration. Andrew, go ahead. Um, on the AP exam, are we going to have like an equation sheet? Or do we have to memorize like all of the equations? The equation sheet is in Google Classroom. Um, you most likely printed it out. Yeah. So, for like the like the actual exam, though, are we going to like? Have That's, so I'm just going to go back to Google Classroom. Um, this sheet in here, this is the exam sheet that you're going to be using on the AP exam. Oh, this. You can see my screen, right? Yeah, it's, I'm pretty sure yeah. it's, yeah. Yeah, this exam sheet. All so right, Tom. you don't have, let's see. I swear they give you velocity, acceleration, but I guess they don't. They start out with the big four. Mm -hmm. I swear that they gave it to you, but yeah, you're going to have to, you're going to need to know, right? The, how position, velocity, and acceleration are related. The three equations it starts out with are the big four. So here are constant acceleration kinematics. Here is forces, friction, momentum, impulse momentum theorem, 
kinetic energy equation, work equation, power equation. Yeah, they give you density. Um, we haven't gotten from here to here yet. Strangely, they place on the right-hand side. That's where you found you can find gravitational potential energy. I don't know why they put it over there. Um, and then they give you the equation for weight. If you look on the right-hand side all the way on the bottom, the second equation up, G is the force of gravity over mass. They give you the equation for weight there. Right, force of gravity is mass times gravity. They just write it in a confusing form. But yeah, they give that to you. Everything else you'd have you have to know or derive from the equation sheet. Good question. Other questions? All good over here. Thank you. All right. Let's head to position versus time. So for position versus time graphs, in order to find the velocity, we take the slope. So if you're given a position versus time graph, x versus t, we take the slope of that graph between any two points on that graph. And the slope will give us the velocity of the object. If the position versus time graph is a straight line with the form y equals mx plus b, like the graph that we're looking at here on the screen, the velocity will be constant because the slope between any two of those points will be constant. It'll be the same. So you would take the change in x and divide by change in time to find the velocity. Okay, if our position versus time graph does not change over time, the final and the initial position are the same. So the slope is going to be zero. So that means that if there's no velocity, the object is not moving. Its position does not change in respect to time. If we're given a graph in which position varies at an increasing rate over time, meaning our graph is parabolic, to determine what the velocity is, we have to compare the slopes of the tangent lines. Okay, so we identify, or we're basically usually given, an, a, a specific time interval to analyze. So some initial time, let's say it's two seconds. So at t equals two seconds, we would use our ruler, which you can use on the AP exam. You can use a ruler. And you would draw a tangent line. So you'd match the curve of the line at that specific instant. And you would take the slope of the line at that instant. You compare that to the slope of that tangent line at that final time interval, that final time interval of interest. So again, you draw one continuous line that matches the curve of the position versus time graph at that time interval. And you compare those two slopes. OK, so if velocity is changing over time, meaning the slopes change over time, you can see that at t1, how would you describe the slope at t1? Would you say it's positive, negative, increasing, decreasing, zero? How would you describe the slope of the line at t1? Anna? Positive and increasing. Okay, so the slope would be a positive value, and it looks like it's increasing, right? The curvature of this line will begin to get steeper. Versus at T2, or sorry, T final, 
our slope is negative. So our velocity is going to go from a positive value to a negative value. So that means that our object is accelerating. Our object is accelerating, which means that velocity is not uniform. It is not constant. The object is accelerating. So whenever we see a parabolic curve, we have to com compare the tangent lines at two time intervals. And that parabolic curve tells us the object is accelerating. Let's head into um, an example. Okay, so for the graph given to us, we're given a position versus time graph, and we're asked to find the instantaneous velocity of the object at seven seconds. So when t equals seven seconds, we can see here that this is a constant line. So when t is seven seconds, we're going to take the slope of that line segment. So you want to identify two points on that line. Specifically, easiest time intervals to identify would be six seconds and four meters. And eight seconds, the object's located at zero meters. So we take the final minus the initial. So I'm going to take zero minus four. over eight seconds minus six seconds to find our velocity. And we would find that the velocity, the constant velocity at that point is negative two meters per second. Because it says velocity, we wanna include that negative sign because velocity is a scalar quantity. That tells us that our object is moving in the basically the negative direction. We're going from a displacement of positive four to a displacement of zero. So it's moving in the negative direction. Velocity is negative two meters per second. Okay, velocity versus time graphs. From a velocity versus time graph, well, if we take the slope, we can find the acceleration. If we need displacement from a velocity versus time graph, we take the area underneath the curve. Okay, so if the acceleration will be the rise over the run, the change in the velocity over the change in time. Right, rise is a change in the y variable, which on the graph will be velocity. Run is a change in the x variable, which on the graph will be time. If we're given a velocity versus time graph in the form y equals mx plus b, meaning that velocity increases at a constant um, rate over time, we would just take the slope. That slope would give us our constant acceleration rate. If velocity is constant, we would take the slope to determine that acceleration is zero, right? If the object's moving at a constant velocity, acceleration is zero. Okay. Last one, if we have a parabolic curve for velocity versus time, which isn't as common in AP1, but if we're given a parabolic curve for velocity versus time, to find the acceleration, we want to take the slopes of the tangent lines at those specific time intervals, t initial and t final. Okay, so if they tell us from zero to six seconds, 
we take the slope of the tangent line at zero seconds and the slope of the tangent line at six seconds to determine what the acceleration would be. Okay, and in this case, our acceleration would be changing. The slope at t initial is going to be a positive value. So acceleration is going to be positive. At t final, our acceleration is still positive, but that magnitude of the slope is going to increase. So our acceleration here is increasing over time. So we say it's non-uniform acceleration. So acceleration is not constant if the velocity versus time graph is parabolic. If you're given a velocity versus time graph and we need a displacement, we would take the area underneath the curve. Okay, so you can see that it's slightly shaded under here to denote that. So we take that area underneath the curve between those two specific time intervals only. We relate it to a shape. So specifically here, right, we would break these two apart. We'd have a square here or a rectangle and then a triangle. We take one half base times height to find the area of that triangle and then length times width to find the area of the square. We'd add those areas together to determine um, what the displacement of the object is. Okay, same thing with the next one. We take length times width to determine the displacement of the object between these two time intervals. So we take the slope to find the acceleration, the area to find the displacement. All right, so let's take a look at an example. So in our graph here, which you can see on your guided notes. It's okay. It asks us for acceleration at two seconds and displacement from four to six seconds. Okay, so to start off to find the acceleration of a velocity versus time graph, we take the slope. The slope will give us the acceleration. So at two seconds, we want the acceleration. From zero to four seconds, we see that we have a constant increasing acceleration. Sorry, a constant increasing acceleration. We have an increasing velocity, which means that we're going to have a constant acceleration. So from zero to four seconds, we have an increasing velocity or sorry, decreasing technically, velocity. So we're gonna have a constant acceleration, right? This is a line segment. So we can take the slope of this. So two points, easy points to pick are usually the first and last. So at zero seconds, the velocity is going to be 30 meters per second. At four seconds, the velocity is um, negative 30 meters per second. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, actually, we used two seconds. So at two seconds, the velocity is zero. And at four seconds, the velocity is negative 30. As long as you pick two lines on this line segment, you should be good. It does specify two seconds. So it is a good idea to use two, sec two seconds. But the slope here regardless of whichever two points you pick, is going to be constant. So acceleration is going to be constant. So you could have picked 0, 30 and 4, negative 30. And you would have gotten the same value for acceleration. Okay, so you want to take two points on the line and find the slope. And we get a constant acceleration of negative 15. That should be meters per second per second meters per second squared. So that should be meters per second per second. Hold on.
All right, I can't unfortunately change it. It's not letting me, but there should be a squared above the seconds. Okay, acceleration is meters per second squared or meters per second per second. So please change that. Acceleration is meters per second per second. Okay, last step to find a displacement when you take the area underneath the curve. Specifically, it says from four to six seconds. So we wanna identify this area here, which most notably looks like a square slash rectangle, depending on how big the graph is stretched. So we're gonna shade in that area from uh, four to six seconds. To find the area, we're gonna take the length times the width. So length will take six minus four seconds. We get two seconds. And the width or the height would be zero minus negative 30. We get negative 30 meters per second. So area is two times negative 30. We get negative 60. Our units are meters. Okay, so from four to six seconds, the change in the object's position is negative 60 meters. Okay, question so far. If you have to go, feel free to leave. I'm just gonna continue recording. Okay, next up, acceleration versus time graphs. So from an acceleration versus time graph, we can derive those from our velocity versus time graphs. If we're given an acceleration versus time graph, when we take the slope, we get something called jerk, which we don't talk about at this level. So we don't usually take the slope. Actually, we never take the slope of an acceleration versus time graph. But if you take the area under the curve, for an acceleration versus time graph, you can determine what the velocity is during that, that interval. Okay, so if our velocity versus time graph is a straight line in the form y equals mx plus b, our acceleration is constant. So that means that our acceleration versus time graph is a flat horizontal line. Okay, so you should have these graphs memorized. I know it's been a while since we talked about them, but we really drilled them in there. You should be able to look at a graph and determine which position versus time, acceleration graph versus time graph matches that velocity versus time graph. If slope is constant, that next value is constant. If slope is zero, that next value is zero. Right, acceleration is zero if velocity is constant. If the slope is changing, that means our acceleration is changing. Okay. Any, t any questions with acceleration versus time graph so far? So we get those graphs from the slopes of the velocity versus time graphs. Okay, next up, if acceleration is constant, like in this first graph that we see on the left-hand side, if acceleration is constant, we have a very special set of equations that allow us to model and predict the motion of objects that travel with constant acceleration. We have constant acceleration in the x direction, and we have constant acceleration in the y direction. If it's only in the y direction, we call it free fall. Okay, but constant acceleration kinematics is only used for uniform or constant acceleration. The variables that we have, right? V initial or V naught is what we occasionally use as initial velocity. V final is final velocity. A is our constant acceleration value. T is our time interval and delta x is our displacement. For free fall, we change delta x to delta y, and we're looking at only the variables in the y direction for free fall. 
On the screen here, you see three out of the four big four equations. Those three equations are on the top of your formula sheet for the AP exam. So you're given those three equations and that they, they are the top three equations on the formula sheet. So V equals V initial plus A times T. Delta X equals V initial times T plus one half AT squared. And V final squared equals V initial squared plus two times A times delta X. So those are the three you're given on the AP exam formula sheet. Only for uniform acceleration. Okay. Free fall is a specific type of constant acceleration. Okay, so free fall, we have a constant value for A. That is the acceleration due to gravity. So it's the magnitude of the acceleration near Earth's surface. In free fall, the only outside force acting on the object is the force of gravity. So the downward pull of gravity is what causes objects to accelerate at a constant rate towards the ground. It's the only force that acts on it. And this is true for projectile motion as well. Our value for G on the AP exam, you can use 10. It'll tell you in the directions to use 10. We assign direction. So we can assign either up or down to be negative or positive, depending on the type of motion. Okay, we're going to take a look at position, velocity, and acceleration graphs for an object that's thrown straight up in the air. So in the diagram on your notes, it's a little exaggerated. Technically, this object is moving up and down along a straight line path. Okay, we're going to draw a position versus time, a velocity versus time, an acceleration versus time graph for this object. Okay, so let's talk about position. The diagram is labeled with three po uh, points, point A, point B, and point C. At point A, how would you describe the position? Anna? Would it be at zero? Zero, okay. so. The initial position of the object is zero. From A to B, what happens to the position? Go ahead, Anna. Position increases. OK, position increases. From B to C, what happens to position? Go ahead, Anna. Position decreases. Position decreases. OK, so we're going to plot three points on our position first time graph. Our first point for point A should be located at the origin. Right, so for point A, we're starting at the origin. X initial is 0. Position is going to increase over time until it reaches its maximum, which is at point B. And then that position is going to decrease over time until it reaches zero, which is point C. How do we know that position versus time? How do we know that position versus time graph has to be parabolic? Anna? Um, I guess because if it was like, just going in a linear direction would be like if a ball went up and never came back down. Okay, so it can't be linear because velocity is not constant. Velocity changes at every instant. Christian? I was going to say that it's parabolic because uh, there's like a constant acceleration. Okay, so anytime the object or system has a constant acceleration, the position versus time graph is parabolic. 
So what's happening here is the velocity is decreasing over time. So if we were to draw tangent lines here, different time intervals, our tangent line would be decreasing over time. And that tangent line would represent our velocity. So the object's going to slow down as the position increases, and then it's going to speed up as the position decreases. So you'll see here, right, we'd start with a positive tangent line. That tangent line at point B would be zero. And then at point C, that tangent line would be negative. Okay, so our velocity is going from positive to zero to a negative velocity. So because velocity is first decreasing and then increasing, we have to use a parabolic curve to represent that, right? A straight line would mean that velocity is constant and it's not constant. It, it changes over time because the object's accelerating. Exactly. So I sort of just gave away part of the next answer, but if we were to draw tangent lines here, initially our tangent line is increasing. So we're going to start out with a positive velocity. Just give you the answer. Then our velocity is going to hit zero at point B because the slope of the tangent line at point B would be zero. At point C, our velocity, if we match this curve here, our velocity is going to be negative. So our velocity versus time graph should start with a positive value because the slope of the tangent line is positive here. Then it's going to hit a value of zero to match that tangent line. And then it's going to finally at point C hit a negative value because the slope of the tangent line at point C would be negative. So our velocity versus time graph is going to start at a positive velocity. It's going to intersect zero at point B and end with a negative velocity at point C. So starting with positive velocity, it's going to decrease and hit zero. And then increase, but in the negative direction. So velocity will end up being negative. Are there any questions there with how to go from position to velocity? All good. Okay, last step. How do we, how would we get our acceleration versus time graph? Anna? Would it be a parabola like going in the, like this? Mm. So if we have a velocity versus time graph, and we want acceleration. What can we do to the graph to find acceleration? Christian? Um, I don't have it. I have like a like a general would it would the um uh, acceleration versus time graph would it be like um would it look like the plot? Never mind. I think I'm so lost. Uh, don't you just think like like the line. velocity versus time graph where it starts at a point and then decelerates or accelerates in the negative direction? I'm sorry, Christian. I didn't qu quite get that whole thing. Can you say that again? I said it. I thought it would look like um, the velocity versus time graph would, where it starts at like a, um, where it like accelerate, where the acceleration like, uh, it's constant like deceleration in the negative direction. But I think I'm like really far off. Um, Andrew, don't you just take the slope, and isn't it going to be like negative line? Uh yes. So it's a it's a straight line, right? So to find acceleration. We take the slope, right? So to go from position to velocity, we took the slope. But because it's parabolic, we took the slope of tangent lines at the three individual points. To go from velocity to acceleration, we take the slope. So to go from position to, the velo to velocity or velocity to acceleration, we take the slope. To go in the opposite direction, to go from acceleration to velocity or velocity to position, 
we take the area underneath the curve. So to get from velocity to acceleration, we just take the slope of any two points on this line. When you take the slope here, you're going to get a negative value. Okay, and the slope is equal to the constant acceleration rate for all free-falling objects on Earth, which is 9.8. So acceleration is a constant 9.8 meters per second squared, and that's negative for down. So if it's constant acceleration kinematics, acceleration needs to be constant. So our acceleration versus time graph is going to be a flat horizontal line. Okay, so those are the graphs historically for free fall. Even for projectile motion, that's what the position, velocity, and acceleration versus time graphs are going to look like. So something that you'll want to commit to memory. Okay, so wanted to go over a few examples. Um, it is kind of on the later side. So if you'd like to leave, you're obviously free to go whenever. Um, I'm going to go through a, f a few examples, maybe two, um, on the two e exams that were attached to classroom. So specifically starting out with, actually, I think that I have to physically leave school at five o'clock. I'm not sure. We'll try example. If we get kicked out, we get kicked out. Okay, so I want to try these ones are on the easier side, but okay. So on the first exam, exam, uh, it's called linear kinematics on top. In the upper right hand corner, it says test A. So this guy here, um, we're going to go through Let's go with some graphing. It's usually the hardest. So we're going to go with number three, number five. And then we'll try um, six through nine. So starting with number three, we have a graph that displays the motion of an object traveling on a straight path. At what times is the object definitely at rest? at rest, so not moving. So based on this position versus time graph, we wanna figure out where the object is at rest, meaning that the velocity is zero. Um, Andrew, go ahead. Isn't it B? one to two seconds. Okay, why? Uh, because if you take the slope of that line, it's zero, and the slope of uh, the, uh, wait, it's called a uh, distance over time graph is the velocity. Okay, awesome. So you're taking the slope of the posi position versus time graph. We want where the slope would be equal to zero. The slope would be equal to zero from one to two seconds. So our answer there is B, awesome. Okay, let's take a look at number five. The graph displays the motion of an object traveling on a straight line path. Which of the following is closest to the object's acceleration? How do we find acceleration from a velocity versus time graph? Anna? You find the slope? We find the slope, exactly. So what we're gonna do here, we wanna identify two points on this line and take the slope. So at zero seconds, the velocity is two. 
At three seconds, the velocity is six. So what I'm going to do here, acceleration is equal to slope. It's a change in velocity over change in time. So I'm going to take six meters per second. Unless I just copied that wrong. Let's see. Yes, yeah, six meters per second minus two meters per second over my change in time, which is going to be three seconds minus zero seconds. So I'll have four thirds meters per second. Um, that is six, right? Yeah. Am I reading this wrong? Uh, it's D, right? Because it's closest. Closest? Yeah. Yeah, it's closest on it. Sorry, this should be a squared. It should be uh, four thirds meters per second squared. Uh, we get 1.3 repeating, which isn't pretty, but 1.3 repeating. I'm gonna go with the closest answer exactly, which would be one. 1.33 is closer to one than it is to two. So our answer there is going to be answer choice D, exactly. Which is one meter per second. Okay, so what I want you guys to do is try six through nine. So take a minute, try six through nine, and then we're gonna talk about them. Okay, just be careful. Each of the graphs is a position versus time graph. Each graph is a position versus time graph. When you're done, done, just give me like a thumbs up so I know you're good. Oh, perfect. All right, so let's talk about um, six. Which graph corresponds with six? Uh, Andrew, what'd you get there? Um, I got uh, C. C, okay. Um, yes, good. So constant positive velocity, slope for C is gonna be positive and the same between any two points. Okay, so seven, we should get B, basically the reciprocal of that graph. It's constant, and the slope will be constant, and in the negative direction. What about eight? So positive direction, so the object is moving in the positive direction, and it's speeding up with constant velocity. Uh, Christian, go ahead. Uh, I had graph E. Graph E, good. Yep. And then last one, nine, negative direction, speeding up with a constant acceleration. Um, Anna? I got F. F, awesome. Okay, so direction 
is negative moving from a positive position to a negative position or almost at a position of zero. The slope of the tangent line is increasing, right? So if we were to draw a tangent line at t equals zero, we get a flat line, which would say the velocity is zero. If we were to draw a tangent line towards the end of that position versus time curvature, we'd see that velocity is greater than zero. So it's speeding up, the velocity is increasing, but in the negative direction. Excellent. Okay. Awesome. Um, other ones that I suggest you try, we're gonna skip because we're a little short on time, but number 11 uh, is a good problem. So I suggest that you try um, number 11 on your own. And I will attach the answer keys to this assignment. Okay, so if you want to try any of the other ones for extra practice, uh, feel free to do that. Okay. Just going to jump ahead and go to a monster of a problem. So I apologize in advance. This will be the last problem we do. Uh, for today. So this problem is on exam one and two dimensional kinematics. So that second PDF. Let me just uh, share that for a second. Where did you go? Okay, so on this one, um, the plan was to do 4, 5, 12, 14, 15, and 16. Okay, so those are good problems. We're going to do 14, 15, and 16 right now. Okay, I'm kind of going to go through it and just show it to you. on the jam board. Okay, so 14, uh, 15 and 16 are connected. We have a daredevil who was shot from a cannon at a specific velocity. I'm gonna use this vector here to represent that, uh, that person's velocity. That velocity initially, V naught, was 43 meters per second. And he shot at an angle, so two dimensions, an angle of 52 degrees. Okay, so we know just based on the fact that it's launched at an angle that our object is going to have a parabolic path of motion. Specifically, this is non-horizontal launch starting from the ground it's going to move upward and make a full parabola. So this is non-horizontal launch. We need to figure out the flight time, the range, and then the maximum height. So what we're looking for in number 14 is the flight time, what time it hits the ground, t equals question mark. We're looking for the range, so the change in horizontal position, delta x as well as the maximum height. So at the top of the path, we're looking for delta Y max. We know that at this max height, the velocity of the object in the Y at that instant is going to be zero. And the velocity in the X at that instant is gonna be constant. So it's going to be the same as the initial velocity in the x at that point. 
We know that the x component of the velocity doesn't change throughout the entire path of motion because there are no forces acting on the object in the x direction. The acceleration in the x direction will be zero. There is, however, the downward pull of gravity in the y direction, which is going to cause a constant acceleration rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. For non-horizontal launch, we use a negative value for A because the, because the object opposes the force of gravity as it moves up initially. So acceleration for non-horizontal launch is negative 9.8. The acceleration for horizontal launch is positive 9.8. Okay, and you can remember that because objects that are thrown directly upward in, in free fall, acceleration is negative. If the object's thrown up at an angle, the acceleration is negative. So for type three free fall and for non-horizontal launch, we make A negative. If it's not those two types of motion, we leave A as a positive value. Okay. Our for first step with these, after we've identified the x and y components of acceleration, we need to figure out the x and the y components of the velocity. So initial velocity is a vector. It has two components, an x component and a y component to its velocity. We need to figure out those initial components in the x and in the y. We do, do so using trig. Initial velocity in the x we find by taking the magnitude of the vector 43 meters per second. And x is always cosine unless the object's on an incline. So I'm going to take 43 meters per second and I'm going to multiply by the cosine of 52. We will not get 33. That's for the second part. So 43 times the cosine of 52, we get 26. Okay, so the x component of the initial velocity is 26. 0.5 meters per second. The y component, we take the magnitude of the velocity again, which is 43. And we multiply by the sine of 52. And we will get about 33 meters per second. Yep, 33.88, which will round to 33.9 meters per second. Now that we know the initial x and y components of the velocity, we can head to Step two, which is to figure out what time the object hits the ground, which is the answer to question number 14. So let me ask you guys, do you remember, how do you find the time in which the object hits the ground? Anna? Using the big four equations. Okay, using the big four. So right now, the information that we know the most. Okay, we're looking for the time specifically at this point. At that point, we don't know what the range is. We don't know the horizontal displacement. What's the vertical displacement? What's delta y at this point? Anna? Zero. Zero, right? It lands and is launched from the same height. So at that point, Delta y is zero. We need to figure out what the time is. We know acceleration in the y is negative 9.8. And we also know that the initial velocity in the y is 33.9. So the initial in the y. We don't know the final velocity in the y. We don't know what velocity it hits the ground with. 
but that's okay. We have three knowns. So if I have delta y acceleration and v initial on the y, what big four equation can I use? Go ahead, Anna. You can use um, the displacement is equal to initial velocity times time plus one half acceleration times time squared. Okay, so delta y equals v o in the y times t plus one half acceleration in the y times t squared. And we're gonna plug in and solve. So delta y is equal to zero. That makes our life a little bit easier. No quadratic equation. Zero equals 33.9 meters per second times t plus one half times 9.8 meters per second squared times t squared. One half of 9.8, we get 4.9. I'm gonna divide each term by t. So each segment of our equation, we're gonna divide by t. Zero divided by t is still zero. The t is gonna cancel out. One of the t's will cancel out in the second term. So I have zero is equal to 33.9 meters per second. Ooh, what mistake did I make? So in the second line here, what mistake did I make? Forgot the negative sign in front of my acceleration value. Got to plug in the negative value. So one half times negative 9.8, I get negative 4.9 meters per second squared times t squared. Sorry, just by t, one of the t's canceled. So 4.9 meters per second squared times t. And now I just solve for t. So I'm gonna move the 4.9 over to the other side of the equation so I have 4.9 times t is equal to 33.9. Excuse my terrible handwriting. Divide both sides of the equation by 4.9 to get t. We get 6.91 seconds. Which is closest to answer choice A looks like. Yeah. 6.9 is answer choice A. So it's closest to answer choice A. So number 14 is A. Any questions there? Okay. For part B to find the range, we use the same version of the equation in terms of delta x. Our range equation is delta x equals initial velocity in the x times time plus one half acceleration in the x times t squared. Most important thing to remember, there are no forces acting on the object in the horizontal direction. So there is no acceleration in the x direction. This entire portion of the equation is zero. A, zero times anything is zero. So we simply take the initial velocity in the x, which we found to be 26, 0.5 meters per second, and we multiply by the time we just found, which is 6.9 seconds. And we get 
why does this keep disappearing on me? We should get 180, I got 183.3 meters. Um, hmm, did I round, did I copy the velocity wrong? I got 80, 180 last time. Let me double check. 43 times the cosine, times the cosine, 43 times the cosine of 52, I get, Twenty six point four. Okay. Twenty six point four times six point nine one. I get one hundred and eighty two point nine, which is closest to one hundred and eighty three. So our answer choice here is going to be um, answer choice A. One hundred and eighty three meters. Okay, and last step, number 16, to find the maximum height. We are specifically interested in delta y at this point. For maximum height, we use the equation by squared equals initial velocity in the y squared plus 2 times a times delta y max. You can really use a whole handful of other equations, but this one's just the easiest because we know that the y component of the velocity at that max height is zero, and it just makes it easier to solve. Okay, but you could use another one of the big four and you'll still get the right answer. The initial velocity in the y, uh, we determined to be about 33.9 meters per second. Don't forget to square it. Plus 2 times acceleration in the y, which is a negative 9.8. Don't forget that negative sign. Times delta y, and that will give us our maximum height. 2 times 9.8, I get negative 19.6. And then I'm going to move that to the other side of the equation. So I have positive 19.6 times delta y is equal to 33.9 squared. I get 11,049.21. I'm gonna divide both sides of my equation by 19.6 and we get that delta y, our maximum height, is going to be 58.6 meters, which is answer choice B. For number 16. Okay. Any questions there? All right, guys. So I know that was a lot. I know that technology wasn't working the whole time, but I appreciate you guys being patient. Um, again, I told you which problems I suggest that you try from each. Um, I'll post the answer keys to classroom so that you can take a look if you do want to try those as extra practice. Um, and I'll actually see you guys bright and early tomorrow. Okay, so have a good rest of your night. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you for coming. Sorry. Have a good one. You too. Have a good day. Bye, Andrew.